Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm Josh Green, your host, Senator from the Big Island, work with the Hawaii IPA and as an emergency room doctor. Today I'm joined for part two of a really interesting conversation with a health expert here in the state of Hawaii. I'm joined by Reg Baker, who is Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer at HMAA, prominent CPA in our community, leader at the chamber, terrific guy, a great deal of knowledge. And we spoke about macroeconomics, so in healthcare, it's good to see you again. Good to be back. Reg, um, you're a terrific uh, wealth of knowledge. We went over some really interesting points about the impact of the national experiment with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we talked about health care costs. We've talked about so many different things. But today we have an opportunity, at your advice, and I think it's very smart, to talk about more of the micro system of health care in our state. Why don't we uh, start by unpacking this a little bit? When you say micro, the microeconomics of health care, what do you mean? I think uh, you know just driving down or diving down into the the, the local aspects of providing health care in Hawaii. You know, um, you know whether it be in a metropolitan area or in a rural area, underserved area. Um, you know, what are the challenges at the state level and the provider level that that's encountered in trying to provide quality health care? And that's that's been kind of a frequent concern that we have. I, you know, I come from the neighbor islands, and a lot of people will say can't find a doctor, I can't find a nurse. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on that? Where are we with the provider population in our, in our state? This may not be politically correct, but I think it's getting worse before it's going to get any better. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm seeing more physicians talking about leaving the profession. Yeah. You know, um, the challenges are great. Uh, the profits aren't as good as they used to be. Mm -hmm. I know that they just came out with this great survey and said that the eight of the top ten highest paid professions in Hawaii are, are in health care, and that may be the case, but it's significantly down from what it was five or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people, I think a lot of the professions, the providers that are out there, uh, if you're over 50 or 55, 60 years old, you're beginning to give some serious thought about getting out of practice and moving on. Yeah, that's a big, that's a huge problem. I'm glad you bring that point up. I, I remember a statistic from a couple, um, a couple years ago, and it had some, it ran something like this: that the average healthcare provider in Hawaii was about four years older than the average healthcare provider in the mainland, which was mm -hmm. to say, our average age was closer to like mid 50s, and theirs were closer to 50. So. Like you say, we could see a wave of retirement if people can't muster up the energy or, or business acumen to stick in business. Well, and I think the youth, the younger ones that are coming out, are not particularly keen on going into some of the underserved areas. They, they have different values you know, that, that maybe some of the older practitioners uh, had. And they're looking more at quality of life. They're looking at a, a better education system, something that... Um, may not be available out in some of these underserved or rural areas. Yeah, that's complete. I can tell you from experience that's true. When I came to Hawaii at age 30, this was in the year 2000, I'm 46 now, I came and worked with the National Health Corps Scholarship, uh, which paid my medical school loans back, which was terrific and I, one of the best experiences of my life. However, I came in, I was single, I didn't have uh, any debt because of that, and I was able to take essentially the lowest salary in the state to go and work in Kau. And it worked out for me because I didn't have a, mm -hmm. a family, I didn't have a house, I didn't have any of those mm -hmm. things. Um, I didn't have children to educate, which is one of the big challenges. People want to have good schools around their kids. And uh, then a few years passed after I did my service. Now I still practice on the Big Island, um, but I have to split my time between Oahu, of course, and, and Big Island. And I think had I come in, as a 30-year-old, already married to Jamie, who's my wife, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and already with a couple kids, and say with a lot of loans, I don't know how I would have practiced in a rural area. More than likely, you wouldn't have. Yeah. You know, it just it would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, to justify, you know, um, you know, giving up what you could have had here that would help with with the wife and the children. Um, to go there where there's very limited resources. It's, yeah. it's, it'd be tough. And, <laughs> you know, there's a lot to love about the rural areas. I mean, I love the teachers and the schools and the principals there and what have you, but sometimes you can't get your car fixed or sometimes you just, you know, you can't find other services like specialty services and all of those things pile on. So I think you're totally right. The providers are, one, reluctant to go work in rural areas. 
Big Island, the economics are a problem. 51% of the individuals on Big Island are on Medicaid, which means that the economics, as you pointed out last show, just don't work for businesses in healthcare. They're going to have to be subsidized. But also, we're short on providers anyway. So if they have a choice, like I still work all my clinical time up in Javi or Kona, but a lot of people don't have that luxury of having their loans already repaid or what have you. And You're very fortunate. Yeah, I, I wonder if that's not going to have to be part of the solution. It'll have to be. I, I think there's two or three things that could be done that uh, and maybe we're doing a little bit of it now, but we need to be doing a lot more of it. But we touched on it a little bit the last, uh, you know, uh, the session that we had. But, um, you know, having, you know, the PAs and the MPs maybe get more involved. They come in a different type of structure. Right. Um, they may not have the same issues that, say, a... Uh, uh, somebody who's gone through, you know, 12 years of additional education to become a physician, yeah. um, you know, they'd have a different cost structure that they could maybe, uh, you know, a nurse practitioner or a physician yeah. assistant could provide some of that care. But you could also get into telemedicine a little bit more, right. you know, and provide some of the more specialty care, you know, through telemedicine type applications. Well, we just passed that, you know, we do a lot of things at the legislature, which even give me heartburn and I sit in the legislature, but we did pass a bill this year mandating all the plans to cover, uh, like they cover other services, telehealth. So I'm hoping that your vision like uh, on that issue may come to pass, that maybe we will have centers of excellence, mm -hmm. Straub, Queens, Kaiser's programs, but that they're able to reach out with those specialists and use either primary care people or ER people like me in the rural areas or nurse practitioners with that telehealth, with these extenders, so that mm -hmm. we get the benefit of the extremely intense, highly trained individuals, where there's a lot of them in Honolulu, a lot more. You know, I can't help but think that you know, for for fifty thousand, yeah, a hundred thousand at the top end, yeah, you could have a very sophisticated satellite type office that has an MP or a PA in there that's yeah. got all the technology that, that the telemedicine can be done the way it needs. And that $100,000 investment in a rural community would provide you with most yes. of the type of uh, you know, care that needs to be done out there. I'm sure that's true. Because, look, the, the monies alone that you save from not having to travel, every time someone travels to Oahu, it's $500 to $1,000. I don't care what you say. Between plane tickets and maybe a hotel and your Red extra tests and, and all that yeah. stuff, if you can get basic follow-up, basic care, of course, there's always a need for a stethoscope on the chest, and some things are surgical. But there's no question that 95% of the health care that I've ever delivered could be delivered through at least some kind of relationship like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I would appreciate it. Okay, so, so that's one. Providers, practitioners, we have to have an expansion. Um, you like telehealth. Uh, what about our hospitals, the local hospitals? How would you look at, at them? What's your, what's your assessment? We have to somehow make them, uh, I won't even use the word profitable, but more cost efficient. Uh -huh. You know, there's, I, I think, you know, I look at what's going on over on Maui, and there's a, a great opportunity over there to bring some very high quality health care yeah. to the island. Um, and it keeps bumping into roadblocks, you know, and it, it's it baffling to me why we're not able to come together and provide 130,000 people with good quality health care um, and, and you know, letting, you know, one obstacle that might benefit less than 1,000 people prevent that. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I think, you know, using that model on other islands, you know, once we can get it to work on Maui, yeah. I think could, uh, you know, address some of the facility issues that we've got. It, it may happen, I think, the sheer economics of our health care system where we've, our, our subsidy of HHSC, Hawaii Health System Corporation, for those out there who don't know that acronym, it's gotten pretty significant. It's over $100 million. And it's money well spent in the care of people, but if we could spend 50 or $40 million instead and have, whether it's Kaiser or HPH or Queens partnering, mm -hmm. it seems to me it would be beneficial. For instance, um, like, give me your opinion of Queens taking over North Hawaii Community Hospital. Is that the kind of model that you think could work? I think if we see patient outcomes improve, mm -hmm. I think if we see additional services being provided and a better level, level of health care, yeah. then yes. Yeah, I think, I think it's necessary. I mean, people, 
people in the neighbor islands already understand that if you have a severe problem, we're going to get you over to Oahu where there's more, where there are trauma surgeons or neurosurgeons or super specialists. We all want that for our loved ones, our children, you know, immediately. Um, and I, I hate to ever have to transfer patients, but what's most important is someone get well. And I think that if we do establish centers of excellence and do a better job of providing the kind of hardcore bedrock essentials at our um, neighbor island hospitals, we'll prevent, first of all, many of those transfers. But when we need them, we'll be better fortified. And so I, I hope that this Queen's um, experiment works. And I, I don't know what to tell you. I guess I should give people a little update. Today, we had special session, and uh, the governor did veto uh, the measure that would have provided resources to um, kind of bridge the impasse on the workforce in Maui. Uh, I'll be quite frank, I would have voted to override that veto. We didn't have a vote on it today. Instead, we're going to look at an amendment next week. And I think something has to be done. It's an imperfect situation. You were an executive. What would, you, would you support something like that in general? You know, I'd, I'd have to spend a little bit more time yeah. looking at the details of it. Yeah. Um, but I heard that it was an additional $40 million. It was, a, it was an additional $40 million that was proposed. I think um, right now he'd like to see a cap at $25 million to get people essentially severance so that they can move into the next model. Uh, you're pretty, you know, you're pretty economically um, frugal, I would guess. But on the other hand, we want the system to at least be tried. Well, for, we, we need to get to health care yeah. to the point where we're going to be proud of it on Maui. Yeah. That's, that's number one. Um, if we could do it, if we have to do it for $40 million, then you do what you got to do. But right. I think that if we were to f explore ways of maybe making it a little bit more economical, maybe even getting Kaiser to participate in some of the offset, you know, th there could be other options that we could explore and see if we could work something out. Yeah. You know, we've got basically three different parties involved. We've got the state, we've got Kaiser, we've got the union. Uh, but we can't forget probably the most important is the population on Maui. Right. And somehow there's got to be a compromise or, or a little bit of compromise on all different parties where nobody's happy, but it gets the job done. I agree because I, I, what I don't think some of those three parties realize, and I'll, I'll claim myself to understand this, is you can spend 25 or $30 million real quickly if you have some terrible outcomes on some people's health. If you, oh, yeah. if you really misdiagnose uh, someone or you don't have services available because you've had to downsize or close a unit or a ward, you could, you could have a catastrophic lawsuit or changes yep. in care. And so I think it's probably better to move forward. Uh, and this is, you know, this will provide a trial balloon to see what's next, what, whether it's Big Island or Kauai. I know that you've had thought about that. I think that we're going to have to get ready for at least some more innovation. I think we do. I, I think we got to start getting creative and try to figure out a way to address some of these issues in a different way because the old way just doesn't seem to be clicking anymore. Right, yeah, the old way of just pure subsidies and no pressure to add new programs or to streamline programs in kind of a confederated state model just uh, we limp along, I guess is the way to put it, and I don't, I'm not sure that the neighbor island folks like that. Now, let me ask you a question. At the normal hospital environment, and then we've got the clinics and the physicians, what's your feelings about the uh, skilled nursing facilities, the SNFs that are that maybe can be a middle ground somewhere in between that provide a bridge that maybe not everybody has to go into a hospital environment. They can go into a different environment. I'll, I, first of all, I really like the model. Uh, very much to use that. I would even go one step further than SNFs. I even like the concept of having um, like LTACs, long-term mm -hmm. acute care facilities, mm -hmm. which for, for those of you, again, f to throw a healthcare acronym out there, uh, those facilities can bridge even some of the more serious acute stuff that the hospitals, if it's a Medicare patient and they've already been there for a long time and they need more services, but it's just simply way too expensive to be still in Queens, and Queens isn't getting reimbursed any longer. Mm -hmm. Having LTAX and a whole, uh, a whole spectrum is what I kind of would advocate for of healthcare services. Healthcare is, in general, a good business to go into, provided the reimbursements are good enough. But I think that with our aging population, we better get ready. Instead of having just like the doctor's office and the hospital and nothing 
in between, we better start inventing this system. I think we better. I agree. So we're about halfway through. I'm going to take a one minute break. This is Josh Green with Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm joined by Reg Baker, who is a health economist in my mind and a leader in our, uh, in our business community. Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, the host of the Savvy Chick Show. You can watch the show every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Honolulu time and enjoy how to be inspired and empowered. If you're a woman or girl, everyone is welcome, but it's really dedicated to you. And we look forward to seeing you. You can also find us on thinktechhawaii.com. See you soon. Aloha. Hi, my name is Justini Spiritu. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m., we host the Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. This is the place you can come to for insight on the perspective and history and passions of Hawaii's farmers and all folks involved in Hawaii's local food system. What kind of folks do we have on? So we have everyone from local farmers, we have foodies, chefs, we also have journalists, uh, researchers, anyone who's actually working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So join us every Thursday and uh, tweet in to us and ask us some questions and leave your comments as well. Hi, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, state senator and ER physician. Joined today by Reg Baker, who in my mind is one of the best thinkers in healthcare. We've had already a part one discussion about the macroeconomics of healthcare in our state. We've now moved on to the microeconomics of healthcare in Hawaii. And we were speaking just a moment ago about what happens in hospitals and health centers and physicians' offices uh, economically. Where is that space in between? What do we do for people that might need uh, long-term care or skilled nursing care? How do we pay for that, Reg? What would you say? How do we do it? Well, you know, you got the standard reimbursements that you would get from the payers and from Medicare and Medicaid, but then um, you'd also, I think, have some of the hospitals interested in taking a closer look at this because if we can get some of these patients out of the hospital beds yes. and move them into a, a long-term care facility or a skilled nursing facility, that allows them to open those beds up and have more of a turn in there to be able to generate more of that first day revenue, which right. is the highest amount yes. of revenue that a hospital can generate. Yeah. And if they can get rid of those dead beds and have more first day revenue in there, they're going to come out way ahead. And they might be receptive to helping fund a little bit of this uh, to get these uh, different facilities up and running to, to give them those beds. So partnerships, partnerships p potentially between the Straubs are, well, the, I guess we should say the Queens and the, the Kaisers and, yeah, the Hawaii Pacific Health of the world. Right. Yeah, I, I see that there'd be mutual benefit. And with an aging population, the, the uh, projection is that by 2050, a full 22% of all of our citizens will be senior citizens. People are going to have health problems. They're going to have heart problems mm -hmm. and cancers. Yeah, and if that's going to happen in 2050, and this is 2016 right now, we better get going. Otherwise, we're not going to make it work. Sure. <laughs> yeah, people have a lot of needs, and we've seen an increase in diabetes. We've seen an increase yeah. in mm -hmm. all kinds of health problems where we do better. Americans are living in many ways um, healthier lives as opposed to 30 years ago, mm -hmm. of course. Well, and they're going to be living longer. By 2050, who knows what that average life expectancy is going to yeah. be. It could be in the 90s by then. Wow. That would be amazing, and people are going to need a lot of care. And, and I think that the model is changing some. As you alluded to earlier, we are seeing some mid-level providers provide care. In Hawaii, we've kind of maybe been a little bit ahead of the curve. We've uh, empowered nurse practitioners uh, mm -hmm. to be PCPs. We've um, experimented with some of these alternative payment models. We've looked at some of the things that the feds are talking about and tried to tease out what might be suitable for us. Uh, but we've got a long way to go because I, I, like you, have seen a lot of angst amongst the provider community. And right now we're already seven, eight hundred do uh, doctors short. If that continues to grow and our population grows, people love coming to Hawaii. Double whammy. It's going to be tough. Well, mm -hmm. we only have a few more minutes left and you have so many different insights. Talk to me about um, what you think the Affordable Care Act ramifications are on Hawaii. W what's your... What's your feeling? And we're heading into a new presidency uh, in the next few years, in the next few months, rather. Well, what's your What's your guess on what's going to start happening? Well, we've already seen one payer fail okay. as a result of the Affordable Care Act. 
Um, I think we're seeing a lot more of that on the mainland. Yeah. I, I think we'll still see some consolidation. I, th I see that there are some large losses being generated, and I'm not long. I'm not sure how long we can continue with that. Yeah. Um, You're talking about like HMSA losing a lot of money. Yeah, and, yeah. HMSA's lost a lot of money. I think some of the others have. Um, you know, some maybe not as much as others, but you've got this um, requirement that you have to uh, risk payment mm -hmm. um, process that if somebody has more of the uh, fully loaded Affordable Care Act policies and others don't, there's a risk adjustment payment that you has to, to ship be money done. in. And so, between, right? yes, and so that there's a, a lot of that going on right now. Matter of fact, uh, there was a uh, healthcare co-op, I think, in Oregon that just this week uh, declared insolvency because of that payment that wow. they had to make. Wow. Wow. Um, and so it's it's beginning to have that ripple effect. It's, it's you know starting to sting a little bit, and I'm not sure how long we can continue to do that. Um, you know, so the. The Affordable Care Act, though, in general, I would say, really hasn't impacted Hawaii too much. Mm -hmm. it, it has created some increased yeah. costs, right? Um, you know, because now we've got insurance policies that got a lot more covered. That's yeah. going to cost some money, and that's where the disconnect happened because they didn't project exactly how much they need to charge in order to cover these costs. They were, in some ways, beneath that, and that's where those losses are coming from. Okay. Um, but, you know, we, we've had pretty good health care in, in Hawaii for 30 years. Uh, and I think we've, we've had one of the lowest uninsured rates in the country. Right. And so we, we had a good model. It seemed to be working. I think this may have set us back a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will recover and get our footing and move forward. Do you think there's any chance that in, uh, let's call it health care 2.0, under the, under the next administration, you think they would entertain taking any of the lessons learned from Hawaii, say, prior to the passage of Affordable Care Act and utilize some of our prepaid health experiences or other experiences in these other markets to, to be effective? I would sure hope so. Um, and regardless of who you support or don't support, Hillary was out here many years ago when when Bill was the president, uh, and took a look at our pre-cared model, uh -huh. prepaid health care model. And she liked it, and she wanted to take it back to Washington and use it as the model for the country. Uh, that didn't happen then. Maybe it was too much ahead of the times. Yeah. Um, and then when President Obama came into office, uh, he had his Affordable Care Act, which was quite different from what Hillary had wanted. Yeah. There's going to be a big push by the Republicans to try and tweak that affordable care model in sure. some form or fashion. Yes. Uh, if Hillary is the president at that time, there would be some room for maybe to come back and revisit that. Interesting. We'll have to uh, rely on our administration and our uh, delegation, but also people like you who are very, you know, well thought out and trusted advisors to many of these decision makers to uh, push some of these ideas. Because I. Interestingly, I don't think they're particularly partisan. I think they're more about people. And okay. if I may, probably a lot simpler to have implemented than what we ended up getting with the Affordable Care Act. It's got simple is good. You know, if you can achieve this desired results and keep it simple, yeah. that's the best model to have. Okay. Well, I think that's just about the perfect uh, note to end on. I've been really pleased to talk to you. I hope we can do this again. Uh, you are a terrific mind, and uh, you've experienced so much in healthcare. So we will come back in the coming months and years sure. to talk more about healthcare. Look forward to it. This is really uh, this is the way I want this show to work, which is to bring experts uh, like Reg Baker here, who has served as a COO, as a CFO at a major health uh, company, who also is in the trenches with businesses. He knows what the chambers have experienced. He knows what small businesses need. Uh, again, I'm your host, Josh Green, with Healthcare in Hawaii, and we're going to keep exploring a better way to get healthcare for our people in Hawaii. Thanks for joining us.